Would you please welcome Peter Singer and his interviewer today, Louise Adler. So, of course, we all know Peter Singer. He's our best-known philosopher. And as if we didn't need, we, we didn't need to, to have this confirmation, but Time magazine confirmed our view in 2005 when they, when he, they named him one of the world's most influential people. He spends a lot of his time uh, teaching, teaching both at Princeton University in its Centre for Human Values and here at the University of Melbourne's Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics. But his career as a philosopher has not been ever confined to the groves of academe. It seems to me when I read his books and his essays and his public writing that he's always felt the compulsion to make philosophy a public activity to show us as a general community how to think. So I wondered if we could start, Peter, with such a generalisation, whether that's the Singer project, in a sense, teaching us how to think, and that you've taken a variety of issues, be they euthanasia, be they animal liberation or animal rights, or in this instance, global poverty, and said, how do we think? I think it'd be a bit presumptuous to say I'm trying to teach you all how to think. Um, you, you can already do that, but I suppose I'm trying to wake people up to thinking about some issues where they're not thinking as clearly or critically as they may do on other issues because perhaps there's a kind of a consensus about these things. There's a set of accepted views that I think need to be challenged, that I think we need to be critical about. So I would say there are particular issues where we're slumbering in our thoughts and I'm trying to set off little alarm clocks about this and this to get people to wake up to them. But when I said you're teaching us how to think, I didn't um, suggest there was a... I wasn't... I, th I was actually um, thinking about um, the, um, our formation as critical... You know, the theoretical language would be our formation as critical subjects, as critical and, cr and analytical subjects aware of the world in which we inhabit. And I wondered whether that was the starting point for your own thinking about particular social problems. Uh, I suppose I, I'm starting from the idea that uh, there's a lot of suffering in the world which doesn't have to be there. That, that would be, you know, to put it at the simplest sort of level. And why, why do we allow, or in some cases cause, this suffering to continue? Uh, if we think about these issues then I'm hoping that we'll also do something about them. So in that sense, too, uh, there's a connection clearly between trying to encourage us to think about these issues and to follow that through with the way we live. So one, the reason I'm pushing you a bit about the critical, you know, us as critical you know, and members of this community of the society is because I think that in each of the books, but most particularly in The Life You Can Save your argument is absolutely... Per it's very direct, but it's also very personal. Mm. You're making this a matter of individual choice, of individual um, a decision, an individual and highly personalised decision, as if collective action has failed us. That's true. I think that, that is true. The approach is an individual one. And people sometimes ask me, say, well, you know, don't you think that there sh should be more government aid? Uh, to which I say... You know, yes, of course, I think there, there should be. Australia's record on official aid is, is quite miserable. We currently give about 32 cents in every $100 that the nation earns. In other words, 0.32% of gross national product. Uh, as compared with the average of developed countries, that's uh, 45 cents in every $100. And as compared with the nations like Sweden and Denmark and so on that do well, who are close to $1 in every 100 So we don't do well. Now, if somebody says, look... Why shouldn't I, instead of giving myself to Oxfam or whatever, why shouldn't I actually campaign for the government to increase its aid and also, this is another topic, make its aid more effective and more directed to helping the poor? And I'm prepared to say yes. You know, If you think there's a good chance of doing that, you think you can be effective in doing that, yes. But, of course, you could come back and say, well, that's still an appeal to the individual. That's still saying you have to do something to try and change the collective action. So it's not so much that I think that collective action necessarily fails. I would love it if we were as, as effective as Sweden in, in terms of the foreign aid we give. 
but that I think it has to start with the individuals. You're not going to get a government that says, oh, I'm going to triple the foreign aid that we give unless you also have a lot of individuals who say, this is an issue that I'm concerned about. Why don't you address it when you run for election? Um, why don't you say what you're going to do and why don't you feature that? So yes, in that sense, you're right. It gets back to appealing to the individuals, all of us here, the people I can reach, the people who mm -hmm. can read the book. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, we can't talk, have this conversation today without, of course, thinking very obviously of the bushfires and the terrible loss of life. And I think many in the audience would share my sense that, you know, we have an idea of ourselves, like we have an idea, we're at a writers' festival, so we have an idea of ourselves as a reading. You know, we love books, Australians love to buy books. That's a furphy, but we, that's a matter for another panel discussion. <laughs> um, but in the same way, we do think of ourselves as an enormously generous nation, which your statistic disproves. And um, what's the kind of... Um, why the discrepancy between... You know, there's, a big, there's too much food, apparently, going to the bushfire victims. There's, there's nowhere where to store it. There's too many clothes now. They've told us to stop giving, um, apart from money. What do you think there is about public consciousness in Australia that suggests we are a um, benevolent and a generous nation, and yet the reality is we're 32 cents. We're way behind the rest of the Western world. Well, it's certainly not only Australia. We saw a very similar phenomenon in the United States. In fact, we've seen it twice in the years I've been in the United States. Um, after 9-11, uh, the Red Cross got a vast amount of money that really it didn't know what to do with um, because there weren't that many victims of 9-11 who were still alive and who were adversely affected by it financially. I mean, there were some, but, but you know, they ended up going into setting up tables in the lobbies of buildings in Lower Manhattan where you had to have a million or two to have an apartment in the building and asking the people walking in, were you adversely affected by 9-11? If so, would you like to make a financial claim? Um, so I think what happens is you get an event which is um, in the media uh, and generates a lot of attention and you have specific people who appear, uh, identifiable victims who and, and that creates this upsurge of compassion and benevolence that people want to help. And, you know, that's great. I mean, it does strengthen us as a community, of course, that we're doing that. And I think it is a, a wonderful thing that people do it. But the problem is how to carry that surge of compassion and generosity to the people who are, who are faceless, really. And, and what I'm talking about in The Life You Can Save is people where we can't really put a face on them. We can quote figures. I quote figures in the book. UNICEF tells us that 9.7 million children die every year from poverty-related causes, whether it's hunger or malnutrition or disease. That's 27,000 people dying every day. That's a figure that obviously dwarfs the toll in the bushfires, although it was a terrible toll. Um, but we don't have a personal relationship, even in the way that we have with the bushfire victims, with those people. And, and it's very hard to get people to think about that broader problem and to respond to it. And you, in the book, you um, describe some research some sociologists conducted into what prompts people to give money to people who are not part of their own community, for example, those who live in Healesville or Marysville. And you're, the evidence seems to be that people connect with an image of one child not even with a group of children, never mind a community devastated, but actually the more personalised is the narrative and the appeal, the more likely people are to give. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, there's a lot of interesting psychological research which I, I try to summarise in the book, and uh, part of it is exactly what you said. Um, you give people uh, some information about a particular child, you show them a photo of that child, let's say it's a small child in Malawi, you say your donation can help Rokia, that's the name she's been given, and you get a much better response than if you say there are thousands of children in Malawi who need your help without naming or photographs or something like that. Um, so that's part of it. There's also this thing that people talk about, uh, they call futility thinking, which I think is relevant, where you feel that whatever you do, there's still going to be a big problem that you can't help with. And, and perhaps in the bushfire case we feel, well, this is a manageable size problem. Uh, whatever it is, 5,000 people homeless or lost their property. We could, we're a big enough community to help all of them to have a, a home again to get, to get what they need. If you have that figure of nearly 10 million children, you think, well, even if I help, can help a few of them, there's still going to be nearly 10 million children dying each year. It doesn't make a difference. And it's, it's really irrational. I mean, it's been done even to show quite clearly that if, if you tell people that there's a particular refugee camp 
and for a certain sum of money, you know, if a certain sum of money is collected, they can save 80 out of the 100 people in that refugee camp, they're more likely to give than if you say for the same amount of money, you mentioned the same figure, they can save 200 out of 1,000 people, then they're less likely to give although they're clearly getting better value for their money. The, the, the money is going further, it's saving more lives. But they think about the 800 people you can't save in the second case and they feel, oh, that's futile. Uh, whereas only 20 people you can't save in the other case, they're saving 80%. They think, yes, you know, I'm more or less succeeding. So you know, if, you, if you stop and think about it, it's, it doesn't make sense because the more people that you help, less suffering... Uh, and so on. But, but we're somehow wired to think in that way and it's very difficult to get around. Um, do you think the media is complicit in producing... I mean, I don't know whether other people share this feeling, but I feel, you know, I reached a point where I thought if I see another front page with a, a you know, photo album of those who, you know, like the Herald Sun had during the week and The Age has done, another 12-page supplement, you know, memorialising all these poor victims, tragic victims, um, actually there's a kind of... Um, and it's not just does it set one's teeth on edge, but it's nothing past the personal connection may prompt us to give, but beyond that, we learn nothing. There's, you know, the tragedy and the individuals, the specificity of those individual lives and what they've lost goes on. That's complexity that we can't even begin to delve into. But these pictures stand in and these images and these humanised images of, of the little girl in the refugee camp, and you've got an image of her in the book, and... Um, it stands instead of analysis, of us understanding the problems, the reasons why we have global poverty, for example, why we have a, you know, an epidemic of AIDS in Africa, why you know, the bushfires occurred. It seems to... Or even the psychopathology of arsonists that one might think is an interesting question to mull over on, you know, this weekend rather than last weekend. It seems to me that those personalised images, um, highly emotional, um, very powerful, very evocative prompt us to one action, which may be, you know, to give, which is a great thing, but beyond that, we learn nothing from yeah. it. Yeah, I think, you're, you, I think you're right, and that does work in, in both of these cases. Whether we should blame the media or blame ourselves is, is another question. I, I, mean, I think there's some truth to, as we said, where people get the government they deserve and maybe they get the media they deserve. Um, if, if, if the newspapers have evidence that they will sell more, peop more papers do. by doing this, do. you know, they're going to do it. Um, you could say, well, they, they could play a little bit of a role in trying to encourage us to think more about this, to have some more analysis. But clearly they can only go so far if, if, if it's a competitive market and their competitor is going to put more of those photos and that's going to sell more papers. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult to break that spiral um, because then we start thinking the way the media uh, are forming us. But but we somehow have to do what we can to... But you're prepared more. to... Use, so I'm, I'm thinking about the particular project of this book, and I should have said at the outset, I guess, that I think, you know, if I, I'm, be, I'm be, uh, being crude about the complex argument that uh, Peter makes cogently and accessibly, but it's a kind of a sophisticated argument, but the argument here is that the people who can afford it um, should actually give, that he has a sliding scale of what giving, what ethical giving might constitute in our society, in Western society, which is, I think, 5%. Of, if one earns $100,000 a year, one should give 5% of it away. And we'll go to some of the detail of that in a minute. Um, but I wondered whether, um, in a sense... Uh, it seems to me that the personal story, that's the project you're setting up, a personal connection to the individual plight of an individual in another place. Rather, let's, we'll move away from the global, you know, the, and the bushfires and talk about global poverty, which is the issue you want to confront in this book. Um, you seem to be arguing, I think you do argue, that we can eradicate global poverty if all of us agree to give, let's say, 5% of our $100,000 income if that's what we earn. Is that the case? That's pretty much the case. I mean, that's, that's the sandbite line. I suppose the, the slightly more complicated line is we can eliminate large-scale mass world poverty. Uh, you know, there's always going to be pockets of poverty. There's always going to be some corrupt dictator where we really can't work effectively in the country. There's going to be a civil war. There's going to be temporary situations. But the idea that there should just be a billion people in the world living in extreme poverty as a permanent state of the world with the consequences that millions of people die unnecessarily. I think, yeah, it would only take a relatively modest amount of resources plus uh, you know, a bit more effort and study into working out what is effective, and I think we could end that. So the book is a call to action. 
Um, but it's predicated on an interesting kind of argument. I thought it was quite sort of shocking to think about, and I'm sure you're right, but you know, you've made a study of this area. But the preface suggests that we have a, it's, an, it's a narrative of progress, that the world is in a better place than it was 40 years ago. I wondered whether you could tell us how you've um, come to that view. Yeah. It feels um, to me <laughs> not great. But... Not great. Well, <laughs> I mean, and you may maybe in the last you know, six months you feel we've slipped back and we probably have uh, in global poverty terms as well as in general uh, terms of the wealth of the affluent world. But, of course, I'm taking the long-term view, which has these ups and downs. Uh, so if you go back 40 years, I mean, I mentioned that figure, about 10, mil 10 million children dying of poverty-related causes every, uh, every year. Uh, UNICEF, in 1961, I think it was, UNICEF uh, said there were 20 million children dying of poverty-related causes. So we've halved the number of children dying, although the number of children in the world has greatly increased because in that 40 years or so, the world's population has, has doubled. So as a proportion of the world's population, it's fallen by even more than half. And that's also true not just if you talk about children dying, but if you talk about the number of people living in extreme poverty. Um, under the current World Bank line, it's 1.4 billion. If you take the same line and go back uh, 30, 40 years, it was 1.9 billion. And again, that was 1.9 billion out of a world population that was um, about half of, of where we are now. So you would have to say that we are making progress and I think it's good sometimes to look at that because otherwise you do get this futility thinking that I was saying. You know, people say, oh, it's just a, a vast black hole, we just pour money into it and it doesn't do any good. Uh, the evidence doesn't support that view. So the book's a call to action, a, p a call to each of us personally to act, and you have some wonderful um, parables or philosophical conundrums that you sort of share with us. I mean, it's really... It's very, I was very surprised. It was a very in, in, enjoyable book to read, even if the subject was sort of, you know, A, one that's guilt-inducing, because am I giving 5% of my you know, income away? Well, I don't have to answer that question in public, but, you know, um, you know, there's a, you know it's a, a pretty uh, confronting sort of book in some ways, that, and one can't but confront, search one soul on the, ma on the matter, but it's also very pleasurable just as a kind of act of writing and, and the pleasure comes from these parables, if you like, and the sort of little tests that uh, you set up I mean, there's, uh, we, could, if, we won't have time today, I think, but we could talk about the elegance of the writing because I think it's really interesting to find a way to speak so directly but to set problems that are quite um, complex for us to think about and to test ourselves on, but one of them concerns a drowning child in a pond and the man, I guess it's a man, of course it would never be a woman with a shoe fetish, so let's call it a man with new shoes. Um, could you um, tell us the problem that the, the man confronts? Sure. The, the, the little parable that I start out the book with is uh, you're, walk, you're walking past uh, an ornamental pond, maybe think of a, a park that you visit quite often, and there's an ornamental pond there. You know that it's a shallow pond. You've seen kids playing in it on hot days, uh, but on this occasion, you see that there's a toddler uh, apparently has fallen into the pond and is flailing around, seemingly in danger of drowning. You look around for the parents or the babysitter, uh, but to your shock, there's nobody there. You, can't, you don't know how this situation occurred, but there's just the toddler and you, no one else around. So uh, naturally, you, you start to rush towards the pond, ready to pull the child out, and you remember, as you, Louise said, uh, that you've actually put on your favourite and most expensive pair of shoes. Uh, and, and the thought occurs to you, oh, if I rush in and save that toddler, I'm going to ruin this pair of shoes. So is that a reason why you might say, OK, so I, it's not my responsibility, not my child, I didn't push the child in, I'll forget about rescuing the child and just go on my way? Uh, well... I take it that nobody thinks that that would be an okay thing to do. Um, you all think that that would be seriously wrong if, uh, for the sake of a pair of shoes, you let a child drown. And the analogy here that I'm trying to draw, or at least the, the thing that I'm trying to get you thinking about, is to say, all right, so, so that pair of shoes might have cost uh, you know, 
$200. In fact, uh, you know, Renata, my wife, said, oh, there's plenty of shoes people buy that cost $500. You don't have to stop at $200. <laughs> Depends a bit where that you are and where you're that shopping. That's a confession, but that's a slip She's in never a confessed woman. to me that she actually has spent $500 no, that's right. on a She's pair of shoes. She's slipping in the information. You'll never understand. It's a <laughs> slip in. It's, you know. Anyway, sorry, go on. Yeah, right. <laughs> So, you know, certainly for that sort of money, given to the right organisation, there's a, there's a very good chance that you could save a child's life. Um, and, and the question is, if you think it would be really quite shocking, the wrong thing to do, to not save the child because you don't want to have to lay out another 200 or $500 on, on your shoes, you know, how can it be OK to just go on your life and not contribute that amount to... Uh, saving children who you don't actually see in front of you. Now we get back to what we started off with, the appeal of the people in front of you. But, you know, morally speaking, is that relevant? Don't we, don't we have similar obligations to children? Again, we didn't, or at least perhaps, arguably, we didn't cause their poverty. There was a big debate, clearly, about that that you could have. But still, we could relatively easily save at least one of those lives. And then you up the ante by, I think there's a, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the man who um, you'd have a discussion with about um, his obligation to his own child to save his own child as opposed to two other strange right, children right. who are strangers. Okay. Yep. So in the book, I, I, there are various people I talk about who actually come close to living up to the really demanding implications of this argument. Um, not just the, the level that Louise mentioned that I talk about in the last chapter, which I think is a sort of realistic level that people could, could give to. But there's a guy called Zell Kravinsky who uh, lives not very far from, from Princeton, in fact, who I see from time to time and get to talk to my classes, who uh, made a fortune in real estate and gave almost all of it away so that he and his family just live in quite a modest, modest house in a Philadelphia suburb and doesn't have much more wealth. And he even went to the length then when he read that there are people dying on waiting lists to get kidneys, uh, he went to a hospital in Philadelphia that serves mostly the African-American community and said he wanted to no donate one of his kidneys to a stranger, which uh, took a little while to persuade the hospital to accept that he wasn't crazy, but eventually they did and he did that. So, um, yeah, there, there's that raises these questions, so how far should you go? And I have this conversation with him. So does that mean that uh, you would save the, the children, two children who are strangers to you rather than one of your own children? He has children of his own. Um, and uh, how far should we go? So Zell thinks that really he should do that, although he's not saying that he would do that. Uh, a lot of people think that that's quite wrong, that we have obligations to our own children that are much weightier and that outweigh obligations to strangers. So there is a bit of a debate uh, in the book on that issue, uh, although, as I say, towards the end I come down to a, a less demanding standard. Mm. Um, one, one section of the book is really devoted to quite practical um, argument around the culture of giving, and you cite, you know, the Judeo... It's a kind of tra tradition within the Judeo-Christian um, uh, culture. Uh, it's a tr certainly a tradition in the Islamic... in Muslim society to give away part of one's income to charity. Um, I've always thought the true... I know of a religious man who gives away 10% of his income every year and his only um, rider on that proviso is that he wants total anonymity. And I've always thought that was genuine benefaction where, and philanthropy where one is going to get no kudos when one is going to have no recognition that one is truly giving. But you talk about the... I call them the uber-rich, you know, the Warren Buffetts and the Bill Gates and the model and the exemplar that they set up for us. What's your view of that? Yes. Um, there, again, there is psychological research that suggests that people are more likely to give if they believe that others are giving. So that suggests that it's a, it is a good thing that Gates and Buffett and others are very public about their giving. And maybe it doesn't just stop there. Maybe we should we should be talking more about what we're giving. So there's a bit of a conflict between what you were talking about, which is the idea that somebody who gets no kudos from their giving, who is quite anonymous about it, is, is more genuinely motivated by the desire to give, by the desire to help strangers. Um, and we may feel that somebody who does talk about it 
Uh, you know, people said this about Bill Gates. In fact, they said it in very crude commercial terms. They said, well, he did such terrible things with Microsoft and, you know, getting a monopoly of this, and, and it's such a crummy system anyway. He's trying to redeem himself by setting up the Gates Foundation and giving billions and billions of dollars to global poverty. I think that's too cynical. I mean, I think uh, Gates really does believe in what he's doing, and he's putting a lot of thought into how to make it effective. And I would give him credit for it, and I would not try and take that cynical view and somehow undermine what he's doing by saying, yeah, but why didn't he shut up about it? I think he's, he is trying to encourage other people with money to do the same. And because I'm more focused on the question of how do we achieve the consequences I want to achieve, how do we actually reduce global poverty, than I am on trying to say, well, who's actually a good person in their heart and who isn't, um, I'll be prepared for people to talk about it and make it more difficult to judge who's more genuinely motivated if the result of that is that we get more money flowing to the people who need it.